In May each year in an isolated coastal village in Devon, locals participate in the ritual capture, slaughter and resurrection of a folk figure they call the Earl of Rome. I witnessed the ceremony myself and in this video I will show you the evidence that proves this rite dates back to pagan times. I'm Tom Rousel. I'm here in Coombe Martin for the Earl of Rhone celebrations. This procession of British grenadiers have been hunting the Earl of Rhone all weekend and now they're ready to kill him. But he'll be resurrected and every time he's resurrected he'll be killed again. Finally culminating in a dramatic ceremony at sundown when he will be drowned on the beach. These Bacchanalian ceremonies, as they were described in the London News back in 1856, had been banned in 1837 due to the excessive drunkenness associated with the event. The vicar at that time banned the ceremony and some friends out, I was Tom and Barbara Brown and some other, a number of other people revitalised it in the late 70s and it's been going on as a village tradition ever since as near to the original procession as we can make it from old writings about what happened back in the 17, 18, 1900, 1800s. This chap riding backwards on a donkey is the Earl of Rhone. Some say this tradition only dates back to the 17th century. An Irish Earl who challenged the Tudors somehow find his way to the woods of Devon where he was hunted down by locals. Except that that story is only apocryphal. And in fact, much of this tradition may be much older, deriving potentially even from pagan traditions. It was originally a series of processions and festivities that took place in the fortnight running up to Ascension Day. But in the 17th century, they became associated with a myth that an Irish Earl of Tyrone, who had rebelled against the crown, fled from Ireland to Devon, where he was killed here in the village of Coo Martin. In reality, the Earl fled to Spain and lived the rest of his days out happily there. And so the myth is clearly an apocryphal tale intended to make the Catholic celebration seem more Protestant. What can be more Protestant than shooting Catholics? But of course, it was never really very Catholic to start with. Rather, it has its origins in pre-Christian pagan traditions. Although, most of the locals are probably unaware of this. What do you think about when people say that it could be a pagan custom? What does that mean? <laughs> uh, that means it, it happens, it dates back from before Christianity when people had <coughs> lots of gods. Um, wouldn't shock me to be honest. The tradition is more than 400 years old. And the lady who came from Radio 4 said, it's very atavistic, isn't it? <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with a bit of atavism, in my opinion. Obviously, it has various kinds of pagan connotations. I, 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 I sometimes jokingly call it a pagan festival, but you know, there's a few pagan traits to it, of course, of course. The dress, the, the, the screaming, the, all of this, you know, but no, there's no rituals, there's no, there's no sacrifice in none of that, you know. You promise there's no one going to be a sacrifice. <laughs> oh God! Oh Jesus Christ! In Italy, by the shores of Lake Nemi, there was a Roman tradition called Rex Nemorensis, or King of the Wood. It was the name of a priest of the huntress goddess Diana, and he dwelt in the woods where he defended his title with a sword. Whoever killed him took the office for himself. This form of institutionalized human sacrifice has been compared to the Earl of Rhone, who hides in the woods for four days before he is captured and killed, only to return the next year. They spent like days and days trying to find him until they captured him up in Ladies Woods. Drum Major had been into the ladies would to search for the Earl. They find the Earl, they bring him out, they sit him backwards 
on a donkey because that allows the village to visit all its sadness and grief and all the bad things that have happened onto the Earl as a, a scapegoat. scapegoat. Yeah. Exactly right. so. The tradition was central to the theories of Sir James George Fraser's highly influential book, The Golden Bow, published in 1890, and as such is often invoked by folklorists when discussing this ritual, although there is no real reason to connect Ku Martin to Lake Nemi. Two of the most notable characters in the procession are the hobby horse and the fool. Traditionally, these would parade about the village for the fortnight prior to Ascension Day, collecting money to pay for the procession itself. If anyone refused to pay them, then the fool would flick them with filth from the nearest gutter using his besom, and the horse would grab and assault them further using a mapper, which was a device that controlled the snapping jaws of the horse. During the procession, the horse and the fool lament the death of the Earl each time he is shot down by the British Grenadiers. The fool then uses his besom to resurrect the dead Earl in a simulated necromantic ritual. And the procession today is where the poor old Earl gets shot at all the way down the street we call each one a death. He then falls off, he's clad in a sacking outfit with padding, you'll see why he needs it later. Present. Taking. March. And the hobby horse then comes up and the napper, like the little mouth, says to the Earl, come on, get up, get up, get up. It brings him back to life. Yes. And the fool has a besom, which is broom, and sweeps in front of the earl and encourages him to get up. And they say, get up, get up, put him back on the donkey, and off he goes again. There are similar traditions of hobby horses in other towns along this same coastline. Namely, Padstow to the west, Minehead to the east. Since the hobby horse tradition also exists in Germany, we should say that it is most likely all those in Britain derived from an Anglo-Saxon fertility cult. This is also supported by archaeology, which has established the significance of the horse and horse sacrifices to the early English people. Indeed, in Padstow, the old os, as they call it, is still believed to bestow fertility on any women who touch it. In Minehead, a local tradition claims that when the town was attacked by Vikings in the 9th century, the Saxon inhabitants dressed as a sea serpent and scared the Vikings away. But this sea serpent is now called a horse. Similarly, in Padstow, there is a local belief that the os was successfully used by locals to scare away French invaders after the siege of Calais in 1346. These likely apocryphal explanations hinted an original function of the hobby horse as a protective spirit which could scare away seaborne invaders, whether French or Dane, from the land. The fool, or jester, on the other hand, is a character with well-attested medieval origins. Its oldest roots seem also to lie in Germanic paganism, since the Icelandic word for jester, amluthi, is thought to have originated from a term using the suffix uthr, a word referring to the divine madness of the god Odin. Indeed, another variant of the jester was called the harlequin, a name from Old French which describes the leader of the wild hunt in Normandy, who is usually identified as the god Odin. The French are thought to have taken the name Herlequin from the Anglo-Saxon Herlekuning, meaning host king, which is a kenning for the god Odin, whom the English knew as Woden.
The sun is setting on Coombe Martin, and it's time for the Earl to keep his annual appointment with the Briny Deep. The horse maidens and other members of the procession form a huge ring on the beach, rhythmically swaying to the drums. The horse and the fool dance for the last time before the penultimate execution of the Earl. The drumming stops as the Earl is brought before the firing squad. The horse passes over the dead Earl and the suited character is discreetly switched for a stuffed dummy. The grenadiers carry the Earl down to the sea where he is drowned until next year. The aforementioned simulated necromancy at Coombe Martin has clear parallels in the pagan folk customs of the Slavs, as does the throwing of the Earl of Rhone into the sea. There is a folk figure in Ukraine known as Kostrobonko, meaning the slob. It is a male effigy of a fertility deity, sometimes ithyphallic and it is widely agreed that Kostrabunko is the same as the pagan god called Yarelo. In the Golden Bow, Fraser wrote that the Priapic idols of Kostrabunko, Yarelo and Kupolo in both Russia and Ukraine were involved in similar rites during Eastertide or sometimes at Midsummer. In Ukraine, they celebrated the funeral of Kostrabunko at Easter and he was represented by a girl in a costume who repeatedly dies and is resurrected each time by a circle of singers. Whereas on Midsummer Eve, a figure of cupolo is made of straw and is, quote, dressed in woman's clothes with a necklace and a floral crown, then a tree is felled and, after being decked with ribbons, is set up on some chosen spot. Afterwards, a bonfire is lit and the young men and maidens jump over it in couples, carrying the figure with them. On the next day, they strip the tree and the figure of their ornaments and throw them both into a stream. In the Murom district of Russia, on St. Peter's Day, people used to take a straw idol of Kostroma dressed in women's clothes to a lake and drown it there. While in Kostroma district and in Ukraine, an old man carried a small coffin containing a Priapic idol of Yarolo, followed by a procession of drunken women mourners before it was buried. Fraser interprets these as a vegetation god who dies each winter and is reborn in the spring. Similar rituals are attested in Poland, where the annual drowning of Marzana, the goddess of winter, still survives to this day. Children make straw idols of the goddess, which are burnt and or drowned. The ritual is attested as long ago as 1597 by Marcin Bielski in the Chronicle of Poland. Nor is the tradition of the drowned god limited to the Slavs. Rali Kamela in Kangra district, North India, is a festival in April during which women wed an idol of Shiva to another of Parvati and then drown them both in a river, then weeping as if mourning them. It is believed this rite can help the women find husbands. Also, in many parts of India, there is an annual celebration called Dusara or Vijayadasmi, which is a celebration of the victory of good over evil, during which idols of the gods, 
mainly Durga, but also Lakshmi, Sarasvati, Ganesh and Kartikeya are immersed in a river. People become very emotional and sing songs of farewell to the Durga Murti as she sinks. In ancient Greek mythology, the Phrygian Lycerses used to challenge people to harvesting contests and he decapitated the losers and wrapped their bodies in wheat sheaths. Then one day he challenged Hercules, who of course won the contest, and then killed Lycerses and threw his body into the river Meander. This myth was ritually reenacted in a Phrygian harvest custom in which strangers in the fields were sacrificed, wrapped in wheat and then thrown into the water. The Roman historian Tacitus described how the ancestors of the Anglo-Saxons in Germany 2000 years ago used to have their slaves carry an idol of a goddess called Nerthus into a lake where it was washed and then the slaves were ritually drowned. It is likely the early English preserved similar rituals which became those now associated with the drowning of the Earl of Rome. Yay! I hope you enjoyed this film. It really does take a lot of work to go on location, interview all the people, film all the different things, research the information I'm presenting, and then edit it into these films. I do it all by myself, except this time I did have some help from a friend who operated the drone. And you can see a link to his channel in the description. But everything else I have to do by myself, and it takes a lot of work. This is my only income. This is my job. So if you enjoy this content, I do urge you to support this channel because it's the only way I can keep making documentaries like this. If you become a patron on patreon.com or subscribestar.com, doesn't matter which, you can get all kinds of extra benefits. You get access to uh, special streams I've done in the past, which are only for patrons. And also if you're uh, one of the mid to high tiers, you can get uh, access to the special voice chats I do where I join in like a hangout online with my patrons and we just talk about the content of the videos and people ask me all kinds of questions and I answer them. And also when I do my AMA, public AMA streams on the Jive Talk channel, which is not this channel, it's a separate YouTube channel I have for my live streams, the patrons who send their questions in get priority. So the first questions I answer for any AMA session will always be those of my patrons. There's also discounts on my merchandise and other perks I'll keep on giving to my loyal patrons who keep this channel going. If you support me, of course, besides these perks, you get the satisfaction of knowing that you are helping to support me in the creation of independent folklore and history broadcasting that this country and Europe in general really needs at the moment. So thank you so much. Keep surviving the jive.